Well, hello again. I thought it would be good to start the session by asking uh, Naomi to just read uh, testimonies of uh, one of our schools. This is part of the harvest that we are after, to hear the achievements of our students, to see how they are performing in the real world out there is just so good. So Naomi, if you wouldn't mind to read us um, the testimonies. My pleasure. All right, so this is a testimony that we got back from Suva Christian Community High School, which is in Fiji. And this was received from Christina Yi, who is the administrator of that school. So she sent us a little bit of a testimony and then attached some messages um, that they had received from parents of graduates. I'm just going to read that out to you. I thought you might be interested in the attached messages received over the past couple of days from parents of former students who have been accepted into universities. Here's a little background on what our 2021 and 2022 graduates are doing. Lakayla Tangaroa completed her COA Year 12 endorsed certificate at the end of 2022. Tafanga Nui Elisara, who is a Samoan citizen, completed her HSAC with honors in 2021 at the height of COVID. She planned to study medicine in New Zealand and apply for a scholarship. In order to qualify, she had to earn a certificate from a Samoan institution. So she decided to return to Samoa and undertake foundation studies. She begins study at Otago University in June of this year under a scholarship. Haley Lucas completed her HSAC with honors in 2022 and is now studying at the University of Canterbury, completing a Bachelor's of Engineering with honors, specializing in mechanical engineering. Paris Volavola completed the HSAC certificate in 2022 and she is studying medicine at the Fiji School of Medicine this year. Hannah Hicks completed the HSAC certificate in 2022. She earned a scholarship and is now studying medicine at the Fiji School of Medicine this year. And I will now read to you um, two messages, two letters that they received from parents. So this one is from the parent of um, Tafanga Nui. And she says, Dear Mrs. Yi, I trust this message finds you in good health and in great spirits. I wanted to inform you that Tofaunga Nui has been offered a New Zealand scholarship to study medicine at the University of Otago beginning in June 2023. We just got the offer letter for her scholarship today and thought to let you know. Thank you very much for your contribution to her education and Christian upbringing. She continues to value her education and learning and it has helped to secure a strong foundation for her education and life as a student. And the other message is from the parent of Lakela. And she says, Dear Mrs. Yi, I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to extend my sincere appreciation and gratitude to you and all the teachers and support staff at Suva Christian Community High School for your support and guidance to Lakela during her time at the school. Lakela is currently studying for a Bachelor of Science degree at biotechno in biotechnology at the Victoria University in Wellington and is enjoying her studies so far. She is also settling in well to her new environment. I'm confident that her time at the school has contributed to her successful entrance to university. And most importantly, I have seen a huge positive change in her character, which will serve her well in life. Again, thank you for providing LaKayla with the opportunity to grow academically and spiritually during her time at your school. And I wish you, all the teachers, support staff, and the students the very best this year and onwards. Thank you, Naomi. Please uh, share those kind of feedback with us so that we can rejoice with you about the harvest that we are getting. That's part of the harvest that we are working for, to hear how our students are performing um, after school, after we've invested in them. And I believe that's just the beginning of the sto story of their harvest. 
So uh, thank you again for being part of this conference, and thank you that you open your hearts and your minds to be inspired to continue with the work of biblical Christian education in the South Pacific Indonesian area. It's so good to have you here and to just, just hear back, get feedback from you about what God is doing where you are laboring for Him, that marketplace presence that you fill with so much distinction. So this afternoon, we are going to end our conference, and um, I'm going to remind us again of the scripture that we are basing our conference on, and that is, while the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. It's still time for us to sow, and it's time for us to harvest. And I hope that in this harvest um, uh, conference, you have uh, built your faith and expect God to bring in a harvest that will bless you. And I'm going to speak specifically to our educators today because there's something in one of the verses that I found that really blessed my heart. And this is why I've decided to to have this um, uh, feedback as part of my session. Um, Mrs. Yee, we want to congratulate you for the work that you've done in Fiji for many, many years. And to see how your students are sharing good things with you. To go to university, to be accepted, to receive scholarship is a good thing. And they are sharing it with you. And then you unshare it with us. And we have that privilege of sharing in the good things. Now let's go to the... Um, the scripture that I want to read this afternoon, and before I read it, I want to remind you that we are focusing on harvest. Now, harvest can refer to either the season, it can re uh, refer to the act, or the place where the crop is stored. As a verb, it can mean to gather, to reap, to catch, to hunt, to remove or extract, such as living cells or tissues or organs, you harvest it, to accumulate, or to win by achievement. And the example that I'm using there is the team harvested several awards. So I want to focus on that to win by achievement. It is so good when you get the feedback of what has been achieved through your team. And the team is the visionary, the leaders, the owners, the staff, the students, the parents. All of us together is a team serving God, serving each other, and when one wins something, when one achieves something, all of us share in that joy. Sowing and harvesting are both physical and spiritual principles that will never cease. As long as the earth remains, it will be there. Sowing requires faith, and harvesting reveals the result of our labor. Most of all, in the broad fields of Christian service, we should work as those who are under the eye of of the Lord of the harvest. We can look at all the principles and do as much as we want, but we need to understand we do what we do under the watchful eye of the Lord of the harvest. Galatians 6, verse 6 to 10, contains seven principles that explain this law of the harvest. These seven principles point the way to true spiritual prosperity and the life God blesses. Now let's read it. It says, let the one who is being taught in the word share all his good things with the one who is teaching him. I want to read that again. I've read it so much over so many years. But when I read it this time around, it just came alive to me. Let the one who is being taught in the word share all his good things with the one who is teaching him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, or a teacher sows, that shall he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now we should not lose heart in doing well, because we, we who do not faint will reap in due time. So then, as we have opportunity, we should do good to all, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Principle one, wherever you receive spiritual benefit, there you owe a spiritual debt. 
Wherever you receive a spiritual benefit, there you owe a spiritual debt. I want to put it in a different way. Where you get taught, share all good things with your teacher. So, although I, I read a different version of the Bible, the, the base uh, language supports that. And it also supports this idea, where you get taught, share all good things with your teacher. And isn't it good that we can use the Bible in different contexts? We can use this scripture in the church and we can say to the church members, where you get taught, share all good things with that spiritual home that you belong to. In a Christian school, we can say to the people that benefit from the teaching and the training and the education, share all good things with those who are teaching you. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor, teacher, supervisor, or monitor. All good things. Now, I, I just went back to the original language to make sure that I understand it correctly, and it's still the same as it has been for many, many thousands of years. All is all. If it's a good thing, then you need to be willing to share it. And you need to share it with those people that are investing in you, those people that are teaching you, those people that are training you up, those people that are walking beside you in your life journey. And it starts in the home. Children are being taught by their families, by their parents, by their fathers, mothers. And they should share all good things with them. That's a biblical principle. And like I said, I've read it, and because the Bible is a big book, sometimes we read over things and we don't get the real meaning of a specific phrase. But in preparation for this conference, I saw that phrase, and suddenly it became alive to me that if we are getting instructed, taught, helped, guided, tutored, or whatever by anyone, we are then in debt to that person. The Bible says we must share all good things with them. It doesn't say give everything to them. It says share it with them. And um, some of the sharing might be like we've heard this afternoon where parents are coming back to the teachers and saying, a good thing happened. My child was accepted at uni. My child received the scholarship and I want to share it with you. I am giving you the testimony. And that testimony is building faith. That testimony is motivating people to understand that what we do is a good God thing, and we need to continue with it. But there is also other implications, and that is that we have other good things, not just our performance or our awards that we receive or the scholarship that we receive. We have other good things, and this is something that I'm praying for, really praying for, is that our students that are performing well in life, that are very successful, and who start to flourish also in monetary terms, will come back to the schools where they were trained and say, I would like to become an ex-student supporting our schools. I want to come alongside you. You invested in my life over the years, and I want to come back and support you as a ministry, as a school, to keep on investing in other young people. In other words, make it very simple, to come and share the money that they earn with the schools, because money is a good thing. And the Bible says you must share all good things with those who are instructing you. This is a very general statement of responsibility with a very wide application. All of us receive instruction in the Word from a variety of sources. It might be through student convention. So are there any of the student convention tutors, instructors who said, I would like to share in your good things? It might be as a level one or level two trainer. It might be as a small group leader in a church or just a personal mentor who feel, felt led to, to invest in a few people and sharing the principles of the Word of God with them. And many of us are instructed in the Word by the books we read and the music we listen to. So if you feel that someone has blessed your life and guided you to gain certain success principles, um, and you want to share that, just share something. Just share something of the good things that you have with that person. The point is not where you receive the instruction, but how you respond 
to this instruction. And as I said, it's a very generalized statement of responsibility with a very wide application. But just allow the Holy Spirit to tell you how you can share those good things that He has blessed you with, with the ones that instructed you on your life journey. If we want to prosper or reap a harvest of blessing, we must share all good things with those who instruct us in the things of the Lord. So if you really look at Galatians 6, 6 to 10, then we see that there is clear principles. And I take the principles in God's Word very, very serious. So no matter how you want to look at it, the Bible actually clearly says to us that let the one who is being taught in the Word share all his good things with the one who is teaching him. And then it ends in saying, So then, as we have opportunity, we should do good to all, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So God is giving us practical guidance of how we should share the good things that He is blessing us with. And He makes it as a, as a stepping stone to success. And when I say success, it's not just in physical things. It's about achieving things that will put you in a place where people will look up to you in your leadership style in your wisdom, in your love for mankind, and also in material things. Principle two is, you reap only what you sow. So I have this uh, feedback quite often where I talk to people and say, if we follow the principles of the Word, then we should get the benefits that the Word is, um, is promising us. And sometimes they say, well, I've been working so hard and I've sacrificed and all these things. And they can't understand why do they do not get the things that is being explained to us in the Word, the harvest that we might get. And then when you start talking to them and assessing the situation, you understand that the principle of you sow and you reap. And you reap exactly what you are sowing. You can't go around making jokes about stuff. And then when those things that you are joking about are being fulfilled, say, but it was only a joke. Because the Bible says we will be accountable for every word we speak. And sometimes we are very flippant and very um, lighthearted about matters. And we just make statements and we do certain things. And we think we can get away later on by just saying, I didn't mean it. Um, I just was teasing you, I was joking, or whatever, the fact of the matter is you have sowed certain things. And sometimes we are losing out in life because we are sowing good things. We are instructing people. We are giving them good content. But our life sows something different. Our conduct sows something different. So we are teaching them good content. But then we do not underline it with our own contact with our own words, with our own love towards them. And that's sometimes where we are losing out on the benefit of the harvest. Because we have good structures, good system, good content. We are sharing the Word of God with them, but we don't show with our life and with our conduct that what we are teaching is a reality to ourselves. I hope you are hearing what I'm saying. I would like to make more practical applications this afternoon, and I hope that I will touch on some of it. But the Word of God says, do not be deceived, because God cannot be mocked. So if, even if you are saying things and say, I, I was just joking, I was just teasing, I mocked you. What we need to understand is that the Lord of the harvest cannot be mocked. God cannot be mocked. And God's principles stay true. God's Laws are fixed, and we need to know that and adhere to that. A man or a woman or people will reap what they sow. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. This is a biblical pathway of God's blessing for believers, and he uses the illustration of sowing and reaping to drive this point home. The explanation goes like this. Since you always reap whatever you sow, 
generous giving, which is a kind of sowing, results in generous blessing, a kind of reaping. The principle itself is easy to understand. If you plant apple seeds, you will get apple trees that will deliver an apple crop. If you plant pumpkin seeds and you harvest round orange pumpkins, do not be surprised. You cannot plant carrots and expect to harvest corn. And you can't plant wheat and expect to harvest rice. You reap only what you sow. That is true in the spiritual as well. And it is very true in the words that we speak, in the confessions that we make, in the declarations and decrees that flow from our mouths. And sometimes we don't understand this, but it stays true. It's biblical truths that we need to understand. Now, sometimes you get to the point where we have conflict, and we don't understand why we have this conflict. Why did this develop? It might be a case of sowing what you have reaped. Instead of sh uh, receiving the, the joy of um, students sharing their good things with you, you actually get conflict. Now, conflict can be the result of the seeds that we've sown, or it can just be because the devil is a deceiver and a liar, and he wants to create conflict. And fortunately, we have the example in the Word of God where Jesus himself had many, many um, issues of conflict. He had lots of conflict, and he showed us how to deal with this conflict. He never lost his temper. He never acted outside of who he is. He knew who he was, and he described that as such, God is love. And he constantly explained to his disciples, we need to love people. And if we don't love unconditionally, if we don't have the kind of love that God wants in our life for the people that God entrusts to us, then sometimes we are sowing seeds that will bring a harvest of conflict instead of good things that is shared with us. Managing conflict is a, a fact and a requirement of love. Conflict is a fact of love. So whether you have conflict because of the things that you've done and the things that you've said and the seeds that you've sown, or whether conflict comes because the devil is not happy with what you are doing and he is bringing strife and tests and tribulations to you, we need to understand it's a fact of life. Even Jesus himself said, if you listen to my words and you obey them, you do what I've told you, the storms of life will come. So storms is part of life. Conflict is a storm that will come to us. But the first thing we have to do is to just take a step back and say, this conflict that I have, is it the result of anything that I have done, anything that I've said, anything that I should have done? We need to assess that because conflict can quickly be uh, resolved if we understand that it is something that I have done and we go back and say, I am sorry, I apologize, please forgive me. And if that is the case, please be brave and courageous enough to rectify what you have done wrong. If it's something that is coming to you and you are convinced that you have really just followed God's instructions and you are a person of integrity and you followed the guidelines and the principles of the word, then you need to manage that conflict. You may either, either cause conflict or you need to deal with it. Managing conflict is therefore a fact of life. It's a, a challenge that we have to deal with. In Matthew 5.43, Jesus said, You have heard what is said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I, the great I am, the one who identifies with the covenant name of God, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you so that you yourselves may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So immediately we are challenged again. If people come against us, if we have conflict in our learning centers, if we have conflict among staff, if we have conflict be between the leadership and staff or between staff and parents, we need to just take a step back and understand that Jesus said, love people anyhow. And assess yourself, assess your own deeds, assess your own words, and make sure that if you have done anything wrong according to the principles in the Word, to just man up and say, I'm sorry, I apologize. Let's take hands and step into the future together. As a leader, you will face conflict, whether you caused it or not. No leadership model will allow you to avoid it. And what we need to understand is sometimes the real players are invisible. It's forces of light and forces of darkness that are contending for souls. So therefore, we always have to put our trust in God and rely on His gifts to deal with the conflicts that we are facing in life. But what we do know is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? I want to encourage all of you. I really want to inspire you to, if you are facing conflict on what level or what area it might be, to first assess yourself and make sure that you have not done anything that you can address and apologize for. And then, after that, trust God. Trust the one who is the light to give you light so that you'll understand how to take the next step. The invisible war is real. Conflict is real, and the invisible war is real. But be assured that it is, in most cases, just temporary. You just need to stay the course. You just need to keep your eye on the ball. You just need to chase after your goals. You just need to understand what God wants from you. And apply yourself to that. And in time, it will pass by. How do we manage this conflict? Fight or flight? Aggression? Avoidance? We have different temperaments. Some are more and some less confrontational. You as a leader in a school... You as a leader in a learning center, you need to develop skills in confronting others when necessary. Don't just allow it. If you see behavior in the learning center that's causing conflict in your learning center, you as the leader need to trust God to give you wisdom and exercise yourself, practice yourself in the skills to address and confront when necessary. What I also want to share with you this afternoon is all conflict is not necessarily negative. Some will actually lead us into a new beginning. And I wish I had the time to just share a few uh, examples with you this afternoon. But about 15 years ago, I was in a very negative conflict situation. And I really did not know how to deal with it I did not know how to approach it. I didn't have any clear um, guidelines of how to, to resolve this. I just had to trust God and pray about it. And each day I said, let's just get through this day. Let's just get through this day. And that went on for a number of weeks. And every morning I got up after praying, I said, let's get through this day. And when people wanted to address stuff, I said, no, let's get through this day. And we took one day at a time. And God eventually resolved it. And the end of that conflict was the beginning of a new dispensation with so much blessings that I understood that God had to allow the conflict to give me the breakthrough at the end of this. So I want to also again encourage you and motivate you to look at the challenges that you are facing. Look at the conflict and then say all conflict is not necessary. Sometimes conflict will release an energy 
And that energy may be directed into different directions. And you will be amazed at the eventual harvest that you get. Just because you did not react, but you allowed God to lead you through it all. That's why Jesus said in his uh, teaching about prayer, that we need to pray that God will not lead us into temptation, but rather lead us through temptation. So let's trust God to lead us through the conflict that we are facing. Let's trust God to lead us through the issues in life. And I'm sure that when we get through this, that those people that were part of the process will see you as a worthy tutor, as a worthy instructor, as a worthy teacher, and they will in future be willing to share their good things with you. The third principle that I want to talk about, I think you would recognize that that second principle and the conflict is a very important part of, of this. But the third principle is this. You will reap far more than what you sow. The size of the seed does not determine the size of the harvest. There are so many other factors that will determine the harvest. But we are responsible for the seed. You remember the story of Jesus where he said, A sower went out to sow, and the seed was good. The soil differed. They were just different areas of soil. So we are responsible for the seed. And the seed is good. The Word of God, the guidelines and the principles of God are good. And we are sowing that. The soil will sometimes determine the outcome. And in some cases, it will be a hundredfold. And you will reap far more than what you have sown. You cannot... Escape the consequences of your actions. If you don't take responsibility for the seed and sow it, and you do that daily, every single day that you are responsible for, um, the students that God made you responsible for, and you neglect some of your tasks, it will, it will bring a negative uh, result to you. But if you are faithful and you come well prepared every day into your work situation, you say, God has given me another day. God has given me the energy. God has given me the product. And I will make the best of this day. Then your harvest is certain. There's a saying, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, and you will reap a destiny. And I want to encourage all of us to, to remember that. Through our words, through our actions, through the way that we conduct ourselves, through the ways that we are dealing with our students, we will stir up thoughts in them. It might either be good or bad, positive or negative. And I pray that we all will focus on stirring up good and positive thoughts in students. And that will then create a, an action. And that action will become a habit. And habit will reap a character. And the character will lead them to their destiny. Principle four. Reaping a godly harvest requires patience and persistence. The Bible says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, I, I want to acknowledge and I want to just say to you, I, I know I've been dealing with people my whole life. And sometimes you are doing good and you feel like giving up because people are jerks. Some of them will always cause conflict. Love them anyway. Things don't go as we planned. Keep on moving forward anyway. People forget to say thank you. Help them anyway. People are hard-headed. Share Christ with them anyway. Not all your prayers are answered. Keep on praying anyway. God doesn't do what you think He should do. Keep on trusting Him anyway. You may be scared and filled with fear. Keep on believing anyway. Your friends may criticize you. Keep on doing good anyway. Do you feel like quitting? It's always too soon to quit. Let us keep on sowing, even if through tears and with a weary heart. In the end, 
We will rejoice when the harvest finally and fully comes. Principle five. We must seize the opportunity before it disappears. The Word tells us, therefore, as we have an opportunity right now. That's basically what the original language says. As we have an opportunity right now. As we have the kairos right now. Let us do good to all people. Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Right now. This very moment that you are in is a Kairos moment that God gave you. Right now, you are the leader of that school. Right now, you are the supervisor in that learning center. Right now, you are a monitor supporting the supervisor and the students in that learning center. Right now, you might be a student that are learning more and getting qualified to just empower you to be better at what you are doing. Right now, this is a Kairos moment. And especially if we have conflict right now, in this conflict, in this issue, we have the opportunity to do good. Do not give in. Do not believe the lies of the enemy. Do not react, but rather reign through Christ in this world. Right now, you have an, an opportunity to do good. And don't let that, word opportun that opportunity slips you by. The word opportunity comes from the Greek word kairos, which is sometimes translated as time. However, it's not a word that means the passing of the hours one by one. It refers to those moments in life when a door of opportunity opens before us and we have a choice to make. Will we go through that door or will we hesitate until it closes. So if it's necessary for us to confront, let us pray for wisdom to confront. If it's necessary for us to go and apologize, this is an opportunity to apologize. Let us do that before that opportunity closes. It is so important to understand that in the moment you're in, that's a Kairos moment, an opportunity that God is giving you to do good. A sculpture one showed his studio to a friend who spotted a very strange statue. It was the figure of a man with hair completely covering his face and wings on each foot. What is the name of that statue, he asked. The sculptor replied, his name is Opportunity. Why is his face hidden? Because men seldom knows when he comes to them. Why are there wings on his feet? Because he is soon gone, and when he departs, he cannot be overtaken. So we have opportunities. Every day we get up, every day that God has given us breath to live through that day, he will also give us opportunities to do good. And we have to take a stand against the seduction and against the persecution and the lies of the enemy and say, I am here to do good. And I'm here to share the good things in my life with those that are instructing me. And you as a teacher, as an instructor, as a supervisor and monitor, you have the right to expect that your tutors will share the good things with you. That is biblical. And if it's not coming regularly enough, maybe let us just look at the way that we deal with them, the way that we engage with them, the way that we conduct the way that we speak, and not just say, it's a good school, it's a good program, and therefore they need to be full of gratitude, and they must honor and uh, recognize me for who I am. It's more than that. It's investing your life. It is investing the love of Jesus in your life into them. It's investing respect in them. It's investing a faith in them that you believe that they can be successful in life. Galatians also ends off by, by this. We owe a debt to the whole world. You need to share your whole harvest with all. Dr. Jo George Washington Carver said it this way. How far you go in life depends on you. Being tender with the young. Compassionate with the aged. Sympathetic with the striving. And tolerant with the weak and strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. And where do we start? We start with the needs closest to you. 
Paul's finest, final instruction is that we are under a special obligation to show kindness to those who are part of the family of God. I interpret this broadly, not narrowly. Because our faith joins us with Christians everywhere, we have a sacred responsibility to do good to Christians everywhere. That certainly applies to the local church you attend, but it reaches out to include other churches in your community, other Christian ministries of all kinds, and even to missionaries in distant lands. And on a more personal basis, it means having a godly concern for fellow believers in your own family, in your own school, in the place where you work. Let's end with this encouraging verse from Paul's letter to the church. Just put in a slightly different way. He says, let's not get tired of planting seeds of goodness. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we won't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Now, I want to end up with this little graphic that I have there. I don't want you to see yourself as a lone person walking in the field by yourself with a little basket on your side, picking a little bit of fruit here and there and say, I've got a harvest. I am prophesying over you. I'm declaring and decreeing over you that your harvest will be as big as that picture. And that God will bless you with people that will work with you. And God will bless you with the tools to bring in a great harvest. Because I know that you will share all those good things with others that invested in you. With others that have tutored you. With others that have instructed you. That, with others that have brought you to the place where you are. And I pray that God will allow others influenced by you to do the same investment in your life. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity we had over the last two days to just engage with our fellow workers, our colleagues, our co-ministers in the marketplace all across our region. And I pray, Lord, sincerely that we will do everything we do under the watchful eye of the Lord of the harvest and that your Holy Spirit will guide us to correct our mistakes. And Lord, to commit ourselves passionately, absolutely to your call in our lives. That we will instruct the next generation to become God-fearing, successful champions in our nations. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you all.